trends come along and practice patterns shift um, is how quickly to adopt, to, to change what I do for patients or what I recommend. Um, you know, the, the early in my career, uh, the, the, um, there was a real momentum, it seemed, behind a, a tr switch to using carfilzomib in the front line um, that, you know, based on phase two data, but very good and convincing phase two data, lots of single arm studies, lots of cross trial comparisons that made it look like that was really the new standard of care and that um, bortezomib based therapy was just sort of old news and, and we should move, you know, move into the future with that. Then the endurance trial, which, which is a well-designed uh, phase three randomized study came out and it didn't, uh, didn't uh, confirm what we, what many of us thought it would, which was that the, the, the new treatment was better. And uh, so, you know, it, it kind of re entrenched what had been the status quo with, with using um, ortezomib and lenalidomide and dexamethasone. So I make an analogy with that with uh, now the use of daratumumab in the front line and using quadruplet therapy uh, initially, which is that we have, uh, you know, really good data coming from the Griffin study. Um, and, uh, and many people have already changed their practice. And I've, ha I've par partially changed, or at least for select patients, I am doing that regimen, but I still wonder, um, you know, are we getting ahead of ourselves? Um, is, uh, is PFS one uh, or is MRD negativity I enough to uh, to to base a, a change that massive on? Um, could there be still downsides in in earlier CD38 exposure and and therefore perhaps earlier resistance? Um, and should we really wait wait for the phase three uh, uh, before we jump on that? And I know I'm I'm kind of lagging behind a lot of people in this, and I I'm. I, I want the, uh, I would love to be convinced that I'm wrong and that I should just get with the program. So I think that, so I'm pretty conservative to switch, right? And I think that, so I, I think that in general, I, I'm known in the field as not being conventional about like autologous transplantation or doing a lot of MRD testing. And so, Part of it is, is I think that I'm older than these guys. And so you can see where, uh, if you look very broadly across cancer, not just myeloma, you can sort of see where people have made mistakes, right? So in this case, what I would say the parallel is, is that there are these massive trials that are done in breast cancer, because breast cancer is very common, right? It's a common problem. And so you, to do these trials, especially in newly diagnosed patients who undergo surgery, you have to have massive numbers of patients. You have to have like 4,000 patients in each arm, something like that, right? And you answer these questions where do people live like a few months longer or something? So you need massive amounts of patients. And so to, obviously to do one of these trials takes like a decade to do, right? And so the question is, is that I'm studying something new, let's say it's X, and then there's the thing that we always have been doing, which is why, right? So that's the standard. And so in the beginning, what you do is you compare your new thing to the standard and let's say the new thing wins. Okay, so that becomes the new standard. And then you have another trial that's done, which is not a randomized trial, which is just a single arm study where it just looks, you're like looking, you're like, oh my God, this looks so much better. So for the next trial you do, which is a large study, you say, look, I don't need to wait for the results. I already know this thing is going to be better. So this is going to be the standard I'm going to use to design my new trial because I don't have time to wait a decade before I design this trial. So when people have done that, there have been massive, there have been multiple times where the arm that they pick as a quote unquote standard arm because it looked so good in a earlier study massively failed when it when in comparison to the old stuff, right? So you got to, somehow, I think in some circumstances, wait for the data, right? And I think, so I think that that's one lesson. And, and the other thing I would sort of say is, is that, you know, if you think about, um, and this and this is partially like, we could have a philosophical discussion about, well, what is the endpoint that matters to you most? Is it progression-free survival? Is it 
overall survival? Is it MRD negativity, right? And I'm very simple. I say like, I, I don't have a lot of people that come in and say, you know, my goal is to be MRD negative. Most people say, look, my goal is to live as long as possible, right? So I'm an overall survival kind of guy. And so one of the things to, to sort of think about is, is that are we, what are the endpoints we think about and how do they impact sort of how we think about things long term? So what I would say is that, you know, it's, it's sobering to me that there are a number of medicines, right? Drugs in myeloma, Blatmap's come out, Melflufen got approved, right? Panabinostat was approved at some point, right? These are trials that were approved, right, by the FDA, and they're approved based upon single sort of arm studies. And now they've been pulled from the market. They're no longer, they're gone, right? So someone at the FDA said, you know what? Either you pull it or we're going to pull it, right, to the company. And a lot of times the company said, we'll just take it off the market. So I think that you got to think about um, there is a, um, we have an ethical standard to hold to. We say, look, we're going to give you the best data. We're going to sort of base it on. There's a lot of conjecture about data that is not solid, right, where we'll compare A and B. But I, I'm sobered by we have drugs out there that we started using in patients and now we can't use them anymore because they're not available. The other thing is, and, and one of the things that really sort of irks me is, so there's a trial called the Bellini trial. The Bellini trial is a trial where you take patients with a specific form of myeloma, those with an 11-14 translocation, and they get Belcade and Dex, and then they either get a placebo or they get this medicine called venetoclax, which is approved for leukemia. Okay. And so there's some data, there was some data that was generated a long time ago saying this drug works especially well in these patients. And so there was a trial that was done. There's trial that was done to compare to use you either get venetoclax or not. So more people, the myeloma went away if you got venetoclax, which is great, right? More people, it stayed away for longer. So you went a longer period of time, right? But you lived a shorter amount of time if you got venetoclax, right? And so when people say, oh, you know, I'm thinking of using venetoclax in this first time, I'm like, but the overall survival is less, right? And it may be that's it in specific subsets of patients, but you need we need to wait for that data before we do it. So to me, I'm just a little more conservative about the switch. Like, I think you can get bullied and pressured by your other myeloma colleagues of saying, oh, why don't you do that? This is what everybody is doing. And look, you know, I went to medical school to be a free thinking person to try to do the best thing for my patient. And I just don't think that that's the right thing to do. So we are all different in the way we view data, the way we understand data. But I would say, I think there are lessons learned where you just kind of think about, well, how are we, how are we using those lessons? And the patients who went on those trials, how are we using that information? Because we owe it to them to now inform what we do now. So that's how I view it. I, that's how I view sort of jumping on the bandwagon and saying, we're going to do this because obviously it's going to be the best thing in the end. So you're not using data via I, So I would say DARA is a little bit different because DARA is relatively safe, right? I would say it's relatively safe. And in certain patients, I would think about it, right? I think that the risk, the risk benefit is there. I think that if there's a potential, you could hurt the patient, and you, but you think you're going to do better efficacy wise, I would say uh, that's probably where I would draw the line. But I, I do use it in some patients, but I don't use it uniformly in everybody. I mean, these are excellent points from both sides. And, you know, these are the struggles that the physicians deal with every day, right? How do we make a collaborative choice that is in the best interest of, of our patient and uh, buys them the best bang for their buck? So, you know, when I looked at the Griffin data, and as I've been following the Griffin data, I think um, there's a trajectory to these data. And I do find that certain aspects of it are somewhat compelling. I, I feel like this is like, you know, the, the, the somebody's dropped a, a watermelon off the side of a building. I feel like it's going to go splat. It's not there yet, but it's probably going to go splat. And I agree very much that a uh, drug like Dara is, we lucked out. I mean, everybody lucked out. Janssen lucked out. Uh, our patients lucked out. We lucked out because it's a well-tolerated drug. It's at a point where you can give it subcutaneous. You eventually get to a point where it's only once a month. 
And, um, you know, by and large, very well tolerated. The oldest person I've given it to was 97 years old and she tolerated it fabulously well. She unfortunately had pre-existing coronary artery disease, which is what eventually uh, led to her demise. But she was doing very well on the drug itself. So, and all of these points are absolutely true. I, I, and I think that um, for someone like me who was very, very transplant heavy because of my experiences in Arkansas, where we were all about transplants and doing two transplants. And I remember when I started at Hopkins, I was this outlier who was like, you know, why aren't we doing two transplants? And everybody was like, that's bonkers. What are you talking about? So, um, and then eventually, not just because I drank the Kool-Aid, but because I was like, you know what? There are instances where the data suggested that makes sense. And there are instances where that 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 isn't nece quite necessary. And so everything has a context and a, and a place, and you really need to try and sift through the data for that. But this, when it comes to Dara VRD, when it comes to Kyprolis, what is my alternative? You know, uh, we mentioned the endurance study, right? A excellent study, right? We, on the heels of the the Sclarian study, which compared Kyprolis melphalan prednisone to Belkid melphalan prednisone, that didn't work. And everyone's like, yeah, that's a, that's a European study. You know, that's the, they don't like using Revlimid. It's cost too much. We have the benefits of predatory capitalism. So we will use Revlimid and combine it with VRD and, and KRD. But that study did not have a ton of traditionally defined high-risk patients. No deletion 17Ps, no transrogation 1416s. It did have some gain, patients with gains of 1Q. It did have some patients with transrogation 414. And these are perhaps somewhat slightly different in the era of proteasome inhibitors with Belkid and Kyprolis. Well, so, but on the heels of that, there is no frontline randomized trial here in the States of Kyprolis versus Velcade. And that's not going to happen. We're not going to see it. But it is interesting. Every retrospective study shows that Kyprolis is better than Velcade. None of the prospective studies show that. Our friends uh, who did the, our, the Forte study, though, I mean, it's uh, combined. It looked at uh, KRD ver with transplant versus KRD for an extended period versus Kyprolis, cytoxin, dexamethasone. These guys said that, hey, look, you know what? We do get these deep remissions with the combination of Kyprolis, Revdex, and autotransplant, except in patients who have perhaps the most high-risk features, the ultra-high-risk features. Lots of application 1Q, perhaps people who have two uh, two hits or uh, two cytogenetic abnormalities. So now when you're the poor myeloma physician who's trying to make a decision, what do you do? And so there are you know, there's a fallback in there, right? You're like, well, you know what? My patient has diabetes and has bad neuropathy. I think I better dispense with that case. Or things of that sort. So there's a lot that goes into that calculus. But but the data, two people look at the same data and they're one's like, I love this. And the other's like, oh, this is just a mess. And I, I don't know yet if there's a clear answer to these. We give it more time, we wait and see. And for each patient, we try and make a decision that's that, that seems to be most appropriate. For me, what was useful lately, I think, in terms of practice, was that, so I'm not using as much Kyprolis as I used to, especially with the advent of Dara. My friends in Amgen no longer call me for any kind of, uh, sort of anything at all. But, uh, but so, um, but what, what was interesting for me at ASH was that um, um, there was this French study, right, where they dispensed with, it was a good study, I think, practically for patients to dispense with dexamethasone, like you do Dara, Revlimid, and dexamethasone, and you just do Dara and Revlimid, which I think the study really was just looking at, you know, it uh, compares Dara, it, it just tries to look at how things are within without dex. And so there's not going to be a huge difference. But, you know, for patients, I think it makes makes a difference, right? They were able to show that Dara, Revlimid is still effective. And it doesn't really, and removing the dex doesn't really cause you too much harm. In fact, it makes your patients feel better. I think on a day-to-day -day basis, although this didn't make a big splash, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, this is something that is utilitarian to my patients. So you, that's what it's like. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I agree with everything that's been said. And um, it's, there are just a lot of challenges of how to interpret data and how fast we move with data that's presented. You know, perhaps there's preliminary data presented at a meeting or Congress as we go to these meetings several times a year where new data is presented, but the final results aren't presented yet. And so then we simulate the early data right away in practice. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, depending on uh, our own personal interpretation of the data. I think back to your original question, Matt, about what consider a Velcade or Fortisimib um, or Carth Dolzman, newly diagnosed patients. And I, I would just kind of give a historical perspective. Of my practice pattern, I was a, definitely a Carthulsmith person, 
uh, you know, five to 10 years ago, you know, I was giving cartels and let alone my dexamethin to most of my patients with newly diagnosed myeloma, really mainly based on the phase two data. So single arm studies showing really high potency with cartels and based therapies, but also to mitigate the risk of neuropathy, which a lot of patients get with portisna, which is, you know, I'm sure patients have experienced neuropathy. It's not pleasant to have neuropathy and it can be long lasting, you know, even after transplant of meats and say for a very long time. And so uh, the endurance study actually gave me pause, you know, and, and certainly you have to take that data, the large phase three study, largely standard risk, multiple myeloma patients, um, as Albas mentioned, it's the high risk patient largely. Um, so it gave me pause. Um, and you know, my interpretation of that study is that it showed pretty, you know, it showed basically the results are similar with you can do or or fortisimib, but the side effects are different. So I think that that's something that, that I discuss with patients is that um, that, you know, carfilzin that has a higher risk of what we call cardiac or renal, which is kidney or, or pulmonary side effects. And we call them like grade two or grade three, which is how we kind of assess the severity of side effects. Uh, whereas, uh, which are actually typically reversible. Those are very transient and reversible. Whereas with Bortensin and Brevelcade, we see a much higher incidence of neuropathy, grade two neuropathy. So just to kind of give a background, you know, grade five, Adverse events are the most severe, grade one are the least severe. And so even grade two neuropathy is, is bad. You know, that means you have trouble with your uh, instrumental uh, activities of daily living. So you have trouble, but sure that's, that's, a, that's a severe side effect in terms of that's your normal day-to-day -day life. And so, um, so even grade two or grade three neuropathy can be not ideal. So, so I think that's sort of where, um, you know, discussing side effects in terms of what patients are more at risk for, um, it's really, really important. It's such an, I think that's nice that we can have options. So, you know, actually in the end, I do, I mean, I, I'm doing a lot of teratinum rap, which is a lot of my best diagnosed standard risk for all patients, but actually I do weekly with Belkates or weekly bortizumab, which actually wasn't used in the trial. The actually, the trial used twice weekly Belkates. So I can, you can say I'm actually using a regimen that's not been studied in any of these trials, right? But I'm just basically extrapolating from, you know, other weekly sort of Belgade trials that show that it reduces the risk of neuropathy. So I'm trying to get the best of both worlds, right? So mitigate the risk of neuropathy, mitigate the risk of, you know, cardiopulmonary renal side effects and sort of adopting the hybrid factors. And I think this is kind of illustrates, I think a lot of this is, a lot of people do this in the real world and it's just kind of sort of, um, you simulate all sort of the data, personal experience, you know, all the experiences, right? And to basically come up with some type of nuance practice approach, which um, may be different than the person next door. And even at the Anderson, uh, which we have 10 myeloma doctors, there's a lot of heterogeneity even in how we practice amongst each other. Uh, so so there is there can be little differences in how we do things. And um, I think that still is just it's just challenging sometimes to be so dogmatic about one is is the, the way to go versus another. I think one, I think that's like incredibly powerful because I remember when Abbas came to Hopkins and he was person who was like, well, you know, I'm going to do 18 transplants on this person or whatever, like some crazy. And I was like, you're crazy. Like, this is insane. I think one of the things I learned from that is, is that, you know, if he could make a compelling argument and, you know, had his view of the data, could make a compelling argument, where am I to say, look, you're wrong? Right. I think that that's one of the things. I think the other thing that's super important is is what Hans is saying, which is, you know, being like at Hopkins, there are a lot of people who are dogmatic and say, you know what, this is how you do things. I know how to do it. I'm right. I I was like the pioneer of the field. I know how to do it. Right. And they say that. And then you say, well, but there's this data that suggests that that's not right. And they say, no, that data is wrong. I know what's right. Blah, blah. So. I think these fellows are great because, you know, we, they think about data. They sort of, if new data comes, we need to use that. So I think using it, thinking about how it fits in your practice. And then I think that if you can come up with a way of doing things and you can defend it in a very um, objective data-driven way, I think that that's a reasonable way to go, no matter how you choose it, right? But I think that the things we don't want are people to say, look, we want to do it 
we should do it because that's what MD Anderson's doing. Like, I'm like, okay, I don't know. I don't know about that, right? Or this, we're doing it because this is how we do it at Hopkins. I'm like, no, that's not right. It's, it's, we are all free thinking people. So we need to think about data as it comes and how it fits into our own minds about how my mama works, right? And then I think that's how we make our decisions. So I think one thing to, to, to take home is, is that you're going to get different opinions from different people, but as long as people can defend them, right, in a reasonable way without saying, I, that person is just wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. That is not an argument. Right? But so I, so I, I would say, you know, with, with Hans, like, it's amazing that, you know, he, you could see how practice evolves over time. My guess is it evolves for the better. So that's the way medicine goes. Thank you. Well, that's great. If uh, just a couple of concepts, one uh, comments, one about the, the Velcade here, one about the transplant. So, and what Bill said about, you know, how the arc of these things is very long, like it takes years to really figure out, you know, how long is someone living? Have we made a difference to how long someone lived? Or even what the duration is. So when we talk about something like, say, what we call a tandem transplant, right, which is a back-to-back -back transplant. And um, I, you know, in certain instances, perhaps, with very high-risk patients or patients that don't get a complete remission after the first transplant, doing a second one might make sense. There's the European myeloma network data and, uh, and um, other data as well that look at the, the same sort of thing. But on a shorter time frame, sure, perhaps that does make a difference. But what about the longer time? Frame? I think that still remains to be seen. But what I really want to say about the, the Velcade is that I think most people, a big chunk of people, especially people who are doing myeloma on a regular basis, give Velcade with Dara VRD on a weekly basis. When you look at the twice weekly dose, though, this is a legacy from going back decades now because of how the earlier trials were done with Velcade on days 1, 4, 8, and 11. And just to illustrate how, how human everyone is in this setup, right? The people who write the trials, people who design the trials, people who do the trials, and how, how everyone who is, who is even undergoing these trials is human. The reason Velcade was given on days 1, 4, 8, and 11, that sounds bonkers, right? I mean, if you're going to give it every three days, do it days 1, 4, 7, and 10. But the thing is that if you do, if you give a study, if you give a drug that you're going to be giving every two days on days 1, 4, 8, and 11, you start on a Monday, then somebody has to come in on a Sunday to give this drug. This is the reason why it was 1, 4, 8, and 11, not 1, 4, 7, and 10. I mean, that's a completely arbitrary reason. And you have to bear in mind, again, that everyone in this is human. These are some of the reasons that go into why things are designed this way. So now when you get down to the Griffin study, this is how it was through all the earlier trials. So it's just like, it. it's 1, 4, 8, and 11, let's just keep on. But nobody uses it that way. Pete Burris is the first author on uh, the Griffin study. And hey, I mean, the first question I asked him after he presented, and after he got off the podium, was like, how often are you giving the that He goes, once a week. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the thing that makes uh, this a hard job, a hard decision process, is also the thing that makes it uh, kind of fun sometimes is that um, you know th there there is no algorithm that we can follow as as time goes on and we get more data we're actually moving further from having a, a simple straightforward automatic this is what we do and that and, and that's the only thing to do because we have many many options we have to choose from them and as as we've all you know talked about there are there are a lot of different factors and there's nuance and there's um a, a certain amount of just judgment and instinct that um that factors into that um because of that one of the things that people do um it, as they go through and have to make their own decisions for their health is uh is talk to various people um none of us get offended by that Getting a second opinion is a, a completely uh, routine and legitimate thing to do, and it doesn't mean it's not it's not a slight toward the the first opinion. Um, it's just uh, one of the tools that can help you navigate this complicated landscape. Is um, you know what somebody else's take on it? Somebody else with a different background, maybe trained in a different era, or has you know has a different uh, way of thinking about this, and um, and, and the fact that you get two different opinions doesn't mean that one of them is wrong. It just means that, um, that, that there are uh, lots of ways to do it. 
Greg, you ain't correct. Yeah. No, no, actually, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, I think that, um, so there's a lot of really, really exciting therapies coming down the pipeline, but I think something uh, that Bill has a lot more historical perspective is, is that, you know, like you mentioned the weight data. And so like, you know, I think one of the questions we always get is, you know, these new therapies, by the antibodies or CAR-T therapies, will they replace the current data care for new diagnosis patients? And I think while we have a lot of optimism and hope, we just have to look at the data, um, particularly when it comes to transplants. I'm not even a transplanter myself. I have no conscious interest in transplant because I, I've never actually done, you know, I've never done transplant myself. I treat or buy well enough without the transplant. Um, I refer to the transplanter at MD Anderson to be the transplant itself. So um, these are some of the things that really to keep in mind as, as, as uh, more data comes out. Thank you.